Live from downtown Detroit, Local 4 News at 6 starts now. Well, there on the left side of your screen pretty much tells the story. The flags in downtown Detroit flapping away straight out as the wind has picked up quite a bit over this past hour or so. And on the right, exact track 40 radar shows we are not done with the rain just yet. Definitely not your typical February day of weather here. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for being with us. I'm Kimberly Gill. I'm Devin Skillian. Several hours are going to remain in our wind advisory that's in place right now. Let's start things off at 6 with Kim Adams in the forewarned forecast. Kim. That's right, that wind advisory goes until 10 p.m., but over the next couple of hours, you'll notice the winds will start to calm down a bit. Uh, the highest wind gusts, though, within the last 24 hours, now Detroit is up to 47 mile per hour gust in downtown Detroit, 40 in Adrian and Coldwater, 41 mile per hour gusts in Kalamazoo, so that 47 is the highest. Very windy conditions out there, but again, it will be calming down over the next several hours. The highest temperature within the last 24 hours came so close to breaking a record. 55, the record was 56, but it did get to 60 this afternoon in both uh, Monroe and in Adrian. So we've pretty much experienced all four seasons in one day. And we continue to have some light rain at this hour. Exact Track 40 radar will do a little street level mapping for you here. Utica, Sterling Heights, Big Beaver, Troy, right at Somerset Mall, getting a, a brief light shower right now. And then we'll go down to um, Ferndale, Royal Oak, also raining there. And in Southfield, over into Detroit, just a few sprinkles. It is dry right now in Lincoln Park and in Melvindale. Well, if you want to keep up to date on everything that's going on when the rain is coming, when it's going, the best thing to do is go to your favorite app store, type in WDIV, download the forewarned weather app, and you'll have interactive radar for your neighborhood right in the palm of your hand. Kim, police have arrested a teacher in the latest case of a threat against a school. It happened at Hazel Park Junior High. Local 4's Rod Maloney is live tonight with the latest. And Rod, this resulted in cancellation of evening activities, not to mention a full security sweep as well. Right, exactly. It was a week ago right now that the police were inside here with canines looking for this bomb that was on a piece of paper that had been left on a desk. They say it was fortunate there was no bomb, but they have arrested a teacher. Last Thursday afternoon, 10 police canine dogs, along with detectives and other officers, went over every reachable inch of Hazel Park Junior High School, making certain a note left on a desk was not a serious bomb threat. Upon looking through school security video, Hazel Park police say that they saw this teacher, 40-year-old Paul Jacobs of Livonia, put the note on a desk for someone to find, and they did. It was Jacob's second year at the school. He did not notify administrators of the note, and police say they still aren't certain whether he wrote it, but they say he admitted to putting it out. School safely resumed the next morning, but it did make a lot of parents wary, and attendance was down last Friday as a result. Hazel Park School Superintendent Dr. Amy Krupe told Local 4 today. This has been ongoing since Oxford, where people are making threats, kids, um, and they think it's funny. It's not funny. Um, it's disrupting to kids. It's upsetting to parents. Parents and grandparents lined up this afternoon to pick up their middle schoolers and the surprise and frustration were universal. I think it's crazy. Yeah, that is really shocking. The teacher should be fired, should not be around kids, should not be allowed back in our schools, yeah. any school. That's kind of because they're supposed to be protecting them. So yeah, that is that kind of does make me angry. Now, uh, interestingly enough, that teacher is now facing a misdemeanor count of a violent threat against a school, endangering or at least upsetting other school children and teachers. Back to you. So, Rod, when is he due back in court? Well, he's going to be back on uh, February 28th for, uh, would appear, a probable cause hearing. But it's a situation uh, where he was arraigned last week, a couple of days after the incident, and he has a $10,000 bond. All right, we'll be following it. Rod, we appreciate it. Warren Mayor Jim Fouts has filed a run for a fifth term in office, but his candidacy is raising questions after Warren voters approved term limits for city officials back in 2020. Grant Herms has the breakdown of what it could mean in this race and in this situation. Grant? Well, Devin, that, like I said, that vote happened back in 2020. The city council says that vote means that Jim Fouts cannot run for mayor again. Fouts, on the other hand, is saying that he has been grandfathered in in this election this year. We took a closer look to see what really is going on here. In 2023, the city of Warren will be deciding on a new mayor. Maybe. 
back in 2020 with a 68% majority, voters said city officials could only serve for three four-year terms. But Fouts says the law doesn't apply to him because he was already in his fourth term when it started. Mayor Fouts was unavailable for an interview. In a press release, however, he said in part, in the coming months, I will do what I always do to serve the people of Warren, taking their phone calls at night and on weekends and getting the job done. My boss is the public. My life and my wife is Warren, and that is what I do every day, every week of the year. Fouts also has the opinion of the city attorney on his side, who wrote back in October saying the new law wouldn't be retroactive, writing, the Michigan Supreme Court has explained that unless there is a clear indication to the contrary, legislation is generally applied prospectively only. Speaking over the phone, City Council Member Mindy Moore disagreed. The intent was to uh, make the term of office of the mayor equal to the term of office for all elected officials in the city of Warren, which would make it three terms or 12 years. And the ballot language was very clear that that included, and the wording was all years prior, all terms prior were included in the count. Now, if this isn't resolved soon, Moore said the city council will likely have to take this to court. Fouts has said that that's nothing new. The city council has sued him eight other times for other incidents in the past. Back to you. Yeah. All right, Grant. A 20-year-old woman is facing murder charges for driving drunk and causing a deadly crash in St. Clair County. Police say Megan Petaniak was with a group of teenagers who used fake IDs to get into a bar back in December. They left in two trucks, collided, and rolled multiple times. This is in Berlin Township. Five people were taken to the hospital, and we've learned one man has died. Petaniak is charged with second-degree murder. She was denied bond today and is in the St. Clair County Jail. A would be thief ended up in the hospital after police say a CPL holder opened fire to avoid being robbed at gunpoint. Happened last night along Gratiot, north of Seven Mile on Detroit's east side. The robbery suspect was rushed to a hospital and at last check was in critical condition. Police say the CPL holder is cooperating and both weapons have been recovered. It's been a sharp rise in the already horrific death toll from the earthquake that hit Turkey and Syria Monday. In the past 24 hours, the death toll has jumped from nearly 12,000 to more than 21,000 people. Emergency crews still using everything from shovels to jackhammers in a search for survivors. In some places, the focus has shifted, though, to demolishing buildings that are so unsteady. In northwest Syria, the first aid trucks from the United Nations are arriving in rebel-controlled areas. Homeless survivors in both countries huddling around campfires outside trying to stay warm in the bitter cold winter weather. Officials estimate about 69,000 people have been injured in Turkey and Syria. A specially trained search and rescue team from the U.S. is in Turkey right now to try to help with these efforts. The group from Fairfax County, Virginia, has a dog that can sniff out signs of life. The team was called in for its expertise in urban rescue when seconds can save someone. When they bring the dog in, what the dog does is the dog will sniff around. It's very well trained, knows what to look for. Uh, and if it responds to the trainer, then uh, the handler rather, then they know that there, there is a possible proof of life. Uh, and so they'll mark that down as a, as a positive hit. And the dog can distinguish between a dead body and a living person. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's amazing. Up next, NBC News is in the earthquake epicenter with more aid arriving. It's ahead at 6.30 on NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. From stabbings to shootings in the last several weeks, we've seen how extreme, even deadly, teen dating violence can get. This month is dedicated to preventing and bringing awareness to teen dating violence. Megan Woods is in Macomb County on a program called Turning Point that's partnering with schools to address this issue. These are some of the love is hearts that the teens have been doing in schools. Just like it's important for youth to know the signs of bullying and school threats, they need to know the signs of a healthy dating relationship. It might sound premature, but Sarah Dobbin, Senior Program and Education Director at Turning Point, says as uneasy as it is, the numbers say otherwise. I think that's a really scary thing to be thinking about that as young as 12, that kids are in relationships and that there's violence potentially happening and that that violence could include physical violence as young as 12. 
That's where this education outreach program comes into play. Turning Point visits middle and high school health classes to not lecture but have conversations on what love is and how to spot the warning signs of dating violence. The students tend to really be surprised about jealousy, that a lot of times teens view that as it's so great, they really care about me, but really that can be a warning sign. She says the biggest thing for parents is believing that it is an issue and having conversations with your teenager. I think it's hard for parents to admit that this is happening and that it's still hard for teens to not just break up with this person, stop talking to them, because there's still typically a lot of connection for teens when you go to school together or sports or things like that. And that was Megan Woods reporting. Turning Point says the warning signs are very similar to adult domestic violence. One major red flag is the abuser demanding access to all of the victim's social media accounts. This education program is looking to expand. For more information on that and resources like their 24-hour hotline, visit ClickOnDetroit.com.